Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming back to the Rachel Wilson program on YouTube. I have a very special guest for you guys today. His name is David Erhan, and he is in Turkey, right? Is that where you are? Yes, I am. Still yes. currently for like three, four years, the last three, four years. Okay. And he is an, an Eastern Orthodox apologist. He has a fabulous YouTube channel, which I'm a huge fan of. You absolutely have to go over there and subscribe to him and watch all his videos because they're excellent. Um, and he's joining me today because I've been wanting to talk about this hot topic right now in the Christian world of women in the church. Can they be clergy? Can they be deaconesses? Can they be altar servers? Can they be pastors or priests? What's the proper role? And like, what are the arguments for and against? And we're just going to kind of go over some of this stuff today, because uh, as you guys might know, Eastern Orthodoxy is not a Western conception. And the Roman Catholics and the Protestants who are Western Christians have already started adopting a lot of the woman clergy stuff into their churches. I think it's been pretty disastrous for them, but we'll get into all that later. The Roman Catholics are in a big kerfuffle right now because they're about to have a synod where they're going to discuss whether they might have female clergy in the Roman Catholic Church, which I have no idea what would happen if they approve that because there's certainly a lot of people who are already mad about getting rid of the traditional Latin mass and things like that. But, um, and you guys can send a question. We have the dono chat link up. You can send a super chat if you have questions for David. I know there's a lot of people on my channel who have questions about orthodoxy. Maybe they're a little bit new to it. So we'll try to do some Q and A after our discussion, but thank you so much, David, and welcome to my humble little channel. Yeah, I appreciate it. And, um, I've been looking at your stuff on Twitter. Um, for most of most of the time on Twitter and the stuff that your husband does as well. And I think it's for, for the most part, um, really excellent in terms of like the culture war stuff that's happening in the West, because what usually happens in the West at some point is, you know, has its effect on the rest of the world as well, because I think the assessment that the United States is this cultural empire is um, unfortunate, but it's also true. And so it's kind of important for people even outside of it to kind of take a look before it happens in their country for, for real. Because I remember a lot of things that happened in the United States that didn't happen here in Turkey are happening here right now. And yeah. I think it's going, going to continue happening um, over the next couple of years. And so it's I think it's good to kind of be early in that regard Um if you're outside of the U.S. and if you're in the United States, well, it's your country, so you should obviously be, <laughs> you should obviously yeah. care about what's happening in your country and prepare against the spirit of this age, so to speak. Yeah, for sure. And don't think that orthodoxy is immune, you guys. Um, I think a lot of people convert because they like the idea that it's traditional, and that's true. It is, and it's held the line better than any other church that I know of, uh, but we too have groups with a lot of money and funding and powerful connections behind them who would love to slide a lot of this modernist stuff in the way that they've done with other churches. And the reason for that is church institutions are pretty powerful, right? They have a lot of influence on people and their lives and their thinking. So the powers that be are very interested in co-opting and subverting churches and using them as like a form of soft power. You guys might have seen the episode I did with Jay about institutional capture where we go super in depth on that and how that works. But so let's get into, you know, our church, the Orthodox Church, and how it sees the role of women in the church. So historically, so far, we've not had any women's ordin ordination as far as like women being priests or deacons for the most part. Is that correct? Am I right there? Yeah. So uh, throughout the history of the church, there's never been female clergy. Now, a lot of people might say, well, what about the deaconesses? Because you see deaconesses being discussed in ancient church canons. The Council of Chalcedon is one of those uh, uh, councils which was in the fifth century but what a lot of people do is there's this word concept fallacy going around where they think deaconess equals deacon but woman that's not really the case deaconesses were kind of the these people that played some kind of a role in assisting for example female converts they didn't have a liturgical role and this is very key they don't have a liturgical role to play. They were never understood to be part of the clerical office. The clerical office fundamentally is a bishop, priest, and deacon, right? And 
Uh, they each have their own roles to play. And even if, if you look at the role that deaconesses played, you will notice that they didn't play the role that a male deacon would. And, and that is a very obvious uh, evidence, I will say, that deaconesses were not female deacons, but rather they were, there were people that assisted others. Um, and one could even argue that there are some, kind of, there are some deaconesses even in Scripture St. Paul talks about, but this is the Saint Paul who also says, you know, women should not teach, meaning that women should not hold clerical office, right? St. John Chrysostom interprets that as being able to teach from the pulpit. Uh, right. This means that women can't teach in the sense of they can't teach with authority as clergy. So that's what St. Paul, you know, this is the St. Paul that we're talking about. So we can understand that uh, the deaconesses in church history are not uh, the female version of male deacons, uh, so to speak. And there's other, there's uh, plenty of books on this topic as well. And some people kind of admit that, but they'll say, well, you know, development of doctrine, we just, you know, we should still have it because... We want women to participate in the clerk, you know, in the church life, but they can already participate in the church yes. life in accordance with the role that they play. That is also important. Um, so that argument doesn't really stand either. Yeah, my big problem with that argument is my favorite one to come back because it's very easy to say. Because uh, I hear this from these, there's a little group, there's a little group I've been paying attention to of ladies who really want, you know, female, they want to start with female deaconesses um, and altar servers and readers and um, things like that. And they say they're not looking to get female priests, but I mean, I've found instances where these same people in other circles when they know somebody's not there paying attention it's not in public they will admit that they would eventually like you know actual female clergy like priests or even bishops um but they will say you know well but don't we say that man and woman both have the same nature and they're both image bearers of god so why can't women do what men can do and it's like well our church saying we're both image bearers of God and saying that we are equal in salvation is not the same thing as saying that we are um, authorized to have the same roles, that women should have authority over men. And my big thing is if they always say, well, we want to serve the church too. How can you tell us we can't serve the church? You can serve the church. The only the only logical reason you would have for demanding that women must be clergy is because you want power and authority. And that's not your that's not for you, right? That's very clear biblically and through the history of the church that women are not to have authority over men and that they are not to have power over men. So if you don't want power and authority, you don't need to be clergy. There's tons of roles women can serve the church. And those things are every bit as important. They're just different, but for whatever reason, they're not satisfied with that. And I think it's because they do lust after power and authority. Um I will I will also say like like an example of what deaconesses did in church history is like like they will uh, in in certain and in, in certain cultures where it was improper for a man to kind of handle women when it comes to baptism and chrismating yeah. them that's the role that they played right it's not yes. something that they had authority over uh, uniquely and the point that you mentioned is important and what I like to look at when it comes to questions like this a lot of people like to look at the practical why's and how's you know why is patriarchy true or something like that what i am interested in is kind of like the metaphysical reasons why because yeah. i think once you understand these things it all um ends up unfolding by itself very clearly so as you mentioned men and women are both made in the image of god but women are made in the image of god because they are of man right in genesis we see that eve is eve proceeds from the rib of adam and a lot of people have this understanding that if you have different roles than different functions and you operate these different functions, that means you are lesser or greater than the other. And this doesn't really make a lot of sense because in, in the Trinity, for example, uh, although the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are identical in essence, there is a sense in which we can speak of the Father, for example, being greater than the Son, the Holy Spirit. People don't fear these people because this is quite literally in the Bible, but he's greater in the sense of being the cause of the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? He's it, So he has that kind of hierarchical authority over the Son, the Holy Spirit, uh, but not a metaphysical superiority over them. This is, the, this is quite similar with men and women, right? So there's this kind of hierarchy. 
But this hierarchy does not denote a hierarchy of value or metaphysical importance or anything of that sort. Men and women are um, identical in value, in honor, in importance, etc., etc. But the roles in which they are suited for um, and the virtues that they have are quite different from each other. But just because there's difference does not entail there being kind of this metaphysical superiority. And a lot of people have this kind of understanding when it comes to feminism, and they want to make women like men for this reason in order to yes. have real equality in their view. And that is kind of like saying, you know, we should have real equality in God. So the Father, Son, Holy Spirit have to be completely identical as persons, right? But in, in Orthodox Christian Tr Trinitarian theology, you can already see this kind of um, non-dialectical understanding between the relations of the persons in the Trinity where uh, the distinction does not entail some kind of metaphysical superiority. So this is something very important to point out. And part of the argument that I would like to present in why women can't be clergy is because of that very kind of causal relationship is essentially, uh, you know, this is something that St. Paul says, um, you know, the head of woman is man and the head of man is Christ and the head of Christ is God, right? So you kind of see this uh, relationship and you can already see with Christ and God, right? This relationship does not entail metaphysical superiority or inferiority because Christ and God, they have the same metaphysical status because they're of the same nature. Um, so, so would you like to kind of see uh, here yeah. like the argument that I kind of presented on Twitter that um, you want me to listen, hash out, or do you have any other comments? Yeah. That you well, I, the only thing I want to say about that is that I think the Western conception, or I should say misconception in the West of the Trinity is always, it, we see this coming up over and over again, right? The filioque and the misconception of the Trinity in the West being like this uh, kind of hidden insidious root cause of a lot of misunderstandings of these kinds of topics. And David's one of the best, you guys, if Trini the Trinity can be a sticky topic for a lot of people. They find it difficult to conceptualize. He's very, very good at that. So if you have questions about the Trinity and how that works, especially from the Orthodox conception and the differences between the Orthodox and then the Catholic and Protestant view of that, definitely go check out his videos. He's got a bunch on that that are very, very good. But yeah, I think a lot of people are dragging Western baggage into the church with them, which has all these like postmodern preconceptions of egalitarianism and and uh you know if you believe the filioque then you don't understand how everything that you just described about how the trinity works and the monarchy of the father and things like that so i i think when you have those fundamental presuppositions wrong I can see why people do have a hard time understanding uh everything that you just explained but yes give us your twitter your twitter argument here well, yeah, I appreciate the kind words. And the basic argument uh, in a nutshell is that women definitionally cannot be clergy because the, cler the clerical role, the clerical office is a reflection of uh, the divine hierarchy uh, within the human space, so to speak. So some people will argue that women can't be clergy because they just won't be good at it, right? But I will say even if they will be incredibly great, they still definitionally cannot be clergy, right? So it's not about, you know, who can perform the function better. Um, right. Even though I will, I will agree. <laughs> I will agree that men perform that better. Uh, even if, it, if that wasn't the case, that still will not mean that women can be clergy. Women definitionally cannot be clergy because the clerical office, again, is the human space that is a reflection of God's divine hierarchy. So we need to understand um, what being a patriarch means in the Trinity, right? The father is the sole monarch, right? He's the monoarchos, he's the one source, but he's also the patriarch, that is, he is the father source. And God is a father, not because God has a gender, like people think, some people think, uh, it's because the relation that he has with his eternally begotten son, right? So this relationship is going to be the basis of the clerical office because the father, as uh, many early Christians like St. Ignatius and St. Clement of Rome argued, uh, the father is this divine overseer, This that is the bishop, right? He's kind of this like divine bishop and Christ being man uh, is the high priest, right? So there's this kind of hierarchy of the father as the father source of the high priest, which is why the, you know, the bishop has a higher authority than the priest, right? And, <clears throat> And we can see this kind of, and, and we can see that human fatherhood and human maleness is patterned after 
God's divine fatherhood, right? So if if one is a good father, if one is a good human father, it's because they are acting in accordance with the divine fatherhood of God. And what is, in, in a nutshell, the divine fatherhood of God is the filial uh, relation that one has with his son and and also one ha that the, the relationship that he has with his creation as well. So due to this reflection, uh, we can understand that, you know, women, for this reason, because they cannot be a father source, definitionally speaking, they cannot be clergy. So in a sense, you know, bishops, clergy, deacons, that this is an exclusively male space, so to speak. And St. Paul, when he speaks about the kind of ordering of woman, you know, and then the man is above the woman, and then Christ is above the man, and the father is above Christ, this is the kind of logic behind this. So this liturgical role is reflected in, in the liturgy itself, in the, in the Orthodox liturgy itself. And as I said, woman definitely cannot be the father source, right? And we can understand that the reason why God is not a, God is not a mother is because God doesn't emanate creation as if uh, he is giving birth to creation. Uh, like a mother bull, but rather he, with his command and all of his activities being fatherly, right? Because he himself as a person is the father, have this kind of masculine character within it, right? And so this is the reason why at the same time, men and women have different characteristics and, and different inclinations towards virtues than each other. I will say that in a sense, they all aim to acquire the same virtues, but the mode in which they express these virtues like modesty and, and humility and things of this nature, they are expressed in different ways um, that are unique to each sex, right? And I'm not saying gender deliberately because I don't think gender in the modern sense is... I don't, sense is I don't use it either. I don't use it either. Yeah. I always say sex. Yeah, and, and one can argue, okay, how can women not definitely be, be clergy and that and while it make while it makes them equal to men and i will say that to that is that well you know there are roles that men can do that women cannot do and there are roles that women can do that men can cannot do men cannot be mothers right uh mm -hmm. christ could not be uh, be born of a virgin maria <laughs> So to speak. <laughs> yeah. That can't happen. That's impossible. It has to be the Virgin Mary, right? Because that's the that's the role of a woman to fulfill. Um, and Christ, as as many people clearly understand, is a man. And this is why in Orthodox iconographic tradition, um, we don't depict Christ as a woman or anything like that. I don't know. I haven't seen it yet in Western artistry, but there's prob that probably exists somewhere. Uh, but the reason why is because well, Christ is a historical person. What, when we depict someone in an icon, we depict the hypostasis, the person, and the personal characteristics that are, that are unique to that person. So if you paint a female Christ, that's not really a female Christ. You're basically, I don't know, I guess you have a demonic vision. You're painting that demon, but that's not Christ at the end of the day because right. that's a deliberate uh, changing of who the subject is, right? And similarly, because Christ is a man and Christ fulfills the role of a high priest, which has... Again, masculine characteristics that originate in the father. The office of the clergy is uniquely male. That's pretty much my argument in a nutshell. I can also use other biblical arguments. I've, I've kind of used one previous already in this stream. Um, St. Paul, right, saying a woman cannot teach. So St. John Chrysostom in homily 31 on Romans. And if you're, if you're a historical Christian, I mean, you, you should care about St. John Chrysostom. He's one of the most important saints. Uh, he, was a, he was a fourth, fifth century saint. A great teacher. Many historical Christians have looked to his teaching, and um, he's kind of seen as this great exegete of Pauline doctrines. In his 31st homily on Romans, he explains in what sense women can and cannot teach, right? So when St. Paul says women cannot teach, St. John Christum explains, well, women can teach in certain specific circumstances. We have saints to prove that, St. Nino, the Enlightener of Georgia, for example, and they teach in, the, in a way that, for example, they will teach more so in private. They will teach without having clerical authority. And this is the key point um, that St. John Christian points out is that what it means is that St. Paul is saying that women cannot teach from the pulpit, right? He used the term right. Bema, which is the pulpit, which is occupied, right? When it's given, uh, when a priest is giving a homily. And that is equated with clerical authority. So St. John Christian is basically saying that when St. Paul says, that women cannot teach, 
he is saying that they cannot teach in a clerical authority. They can teach in other ways, but they sure. can't teach within that specific context. And that's the point that St. John Chrysostom makes. And he then, in the same homily, kind of gives other examples of how, you know, in what sense is woman, it, it is proper to women to teach. And this is something preserved within the Orthodox Church for uh, many, many years, with, you know, some unfortunate exceptions that you sometimes see here and there. Um, but I, that's kind of how I would look at it. But if you look at the saints, right, if you look at the lives of female saints, there are many female saints that we have um, that were, you know, the, the you know, the, I, I believe she was the mother of St. Gregory the Theologian and St. Beelzebub. St. St. Bill is the greater St. Gregory of Nyssa. I don't, I don't remember exactly. I kind of forgot her name too, but, um, or the grandmother was a saint and she taught the Cappadocian fathers, right? She taught a great yes. number of saints and who ended up teaching, you know, the whole Christian world, right? I mean, that's a right. great honor and authority to have as a mother. I mean, you basically raised the future generations of people that will educate the whole world in a sense. Uh, yes. We have a theme, we have a, saint who's a uh who was a woman and she made she wrote many different hymns we have saint nino as i said uh who was basically i think she's an equal to apostles figure as well she's considered to be equal to the apostles uh because yeah. she is the enlightener of georgia right and we have even people in uh government roles like saint tamar uh right who, saint irene and all of these other people that we have um so <clears throat> It's, it's not, so patriarchy doesn't mean that, you know, women are slaves and this kind of nonsensical beliefs. It just says that, you know, what women and men can do in some sense, they can do the same thing, but they do it in different modes. That is in accordance right. with gender and who they are as a person. Like, so that's kind of something to bear in mind so that we don't misunderstand what the Orthodox Church is teaching with relation to men and women. Because I think a lot of people misunderstand that, uh, you know, when you speak about different roles, they think that men are superior to women, and that's absolutely not what the church is saying. And that's absolutely not what I will say most patriarchy proponents are saying. That's that will be that is religious in nature. Probably some very few minorities of people, but I don't think yeah. they should be listened to either. Right? Yeah. For example, uh, my patron saint is Saint Catherine of Alexandria, who was like a great philosopher and apologist who was sent 50 of the greatest uh, pagan philosophers of the time by the emperor who wanted to convert her away from Christianity and back to paganism. She ended up converting all of them and was so convincing because she had the aid of the Holy Spirit that those men actually ended up being willing to be martyred for Christianity. Um, and then she herself was later also martyred for it. But she, uh, you know, was given this kind of special position where she was the only person who could do this. And so with the aid of the Holy Spirit, she was able to, you know, kind of do this apologia and and convert these people from paganism, which was incredible, I thought. Um, and she was kind of early on when I was inquiring, Father Deacon Ananias kind of said, I think you should read about her. I think you should look into her because that's his wife's patron saint. He thought that I might enjoy her too. And I definitely did feel a connection with her right away. I also homeschool my kids. I teach my kids, right? Um, I write books about history and, and things like this. So it's not like women cannot share information. In fact, we have a duty as older Christian women to teach younger Christian women. This is like a duty we have. It's not just something we can do. It's something we ought to be doing. Um, and we don't have this anymore, especially, well, in the West. In other places, I think you still do. But here, where, where I am, we don't at all. Um, and so, yeah, older women should be helping younger women, helping them learn to be mothers, helping them learn to be good Christians and how to act appropriately and behave and think appropriately, how to get along in their marriage, all these kind of really important things that we need women for. But for some reason, lately in modern times, it's like women want to do anything but what they're supposed to do, what their God-given role is. And they want only to be doing whatever it is that the men are doing. If, you know, if men are teaching, they want to do that. If men are rulers of something, they want to do that. And they want equality, but not really. So it, it gets very tricky to talk about this because I don't want to push women away from the faith, of course. And I know that a lot of them have these presuppositions about equality and things like that. But um, 
if you look at what's happened in the Protestant world, which is where I come from, where they started having female preachers around the time of, I'd say like the mid 19th century and the great awakening in the United States, which if you ever look into that, I do have a chapter in my book on it because I think it was so important. If you're not familiar with the, the craziness of the first great awakening here in America, it was this time of Protestant spiritual revival where every heresy on earth was being, you know, kind of taught. It was kind of like, um, what we have on YouTube, but it was like in person. So they would have these big outdoor open air, like preaching festivals. And you'd have all these different preachers. Some would be Quakers, Shakers, Baptists, Presbyterians, Anglicans, uh, di not as many Anglicans, but more of the kind of crazier, more, this is like the roots of the charismatic movement and Protestantism too, where whatever preacher was the most engaging and fun to watch live and had the most like, you know, special sauce to throw on his sermon or whatever to get people really hyped up and emotional and could draw large crowds. They would get tons of money. They could start a church and things like that. So here in America, we're dealing with kind of a, a century and a half of after effects from this where we have historical precedent of all kinds of heresies that we're dealing with. And we had some crazy female preachers that came out of this um, that had like huge churches in the 1920s and 30s. And these women were just like the televangelists of today. And they were faith healing people and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So I, I'm in a place where I'm kind of coming from this background of all this Protestant stuff where we have a century plus of women thinking, yeah, I can be a preacher. If I can get up there and I can draw a crowd and people are going to listen to me. And I say, the Holy Spirit is guiding me to, you know, this is God's mission for me. And you can't tell me otherwise. I've had this, this discussion with lots of different female pastor ladies on Twitter where I'm kind of challenging them to, to tell me, okay, why should you be a, a priest? Why should you be a pastor? And when, and if you want to talk about theology with them, I've not come across one yet that doesn't just crumble within like the first two questions I ask. So that's also very disheartening. But I, all of this to say women are valuable and they're seen as valuable in the church. You're not going to come to the Orthodox Church and be chained to a stove and forced to give birth until you, you know, die in childbirth or something. <laughs> it's not that way. But we do hold to tradition and we do hold to 2000 year old even older than that, because we believe that, you know, we go all the way back through the Old Testament. We hold to the traditions of the church for a reason. These traditions aren't there to oppress people. The church, the, the church was the first uh, great, like, true liberator. The, this new libertarian stuff is actually Luciferian, but orthodoxy liberates people from sin, right? It li liberates them from sin and, um, vice and things like that. So David was talking about how the two sexes approach the virtues differently. And I think that's a really great point that I haven't heard anyone bring up, but it makes a ton of sense to me how women will move toward the virtues one way and men move toward them in a different way. And this is where we get into, you know, these huge debates that are popular right now with like the red pill where it's like, well, is it the same for women, you know, to do this as it is for men? And nobody can seem to figure this out. But these are these are new problems. There was never this uh, impression that women were the same as men until technology was able to kind of give people this illusion that they're the same. So historically through the church, uh, what do you think were, were some of the differences in the ways that men and women would kind of like move toward the virtues or toward salvation? Yeah, well, I want to kind of track back a little bit. So the one I yeah. was talking about was the grandmother of St. Gregory the Theologian, St. Macrina the Elder. Uh, so she was uh, educated by St. Gregory the Wonder Worker, and she is credited with uh, giving uh, you know great uh, influence in piety to her children and grandchildren, but also she influenced greatly their intellectual training too, right? So this kind of again, explains the, the important role that mothers still play. And, you know, the, it, a, woman, a, a mother can be incredibly powerful. And a lot of people, I think, really <laughs> underestimate that. And if you look, kind of look at, especially people like St. Macrina, this is uh, seen very clearly. Another thing that is relevant to uh, what you touched on 
is something that St. Gregory, the theologian, talks about. So this is from a letter he gives to uh, his spiritual daughter, who is, I think she was a nobility, and she's married into the nobility as well. And in this, in this letter, one of the things that he says, and this is really important, um, it, you know, he talks about, you know, the importance of what a woman can, what a woman must do, right? So he talks about how the woman must respect the husband and love the husband unconditionally, whereas the husband kind of uh, takes the responsibility of guiding and leading the marriage. So I think yes. Father Cosmas talks about this, right? Father Cosmas from Orthodox talks, one of the things that he points out is that, you know, the, the woman um, who is in submission, right, she can give guidance to the husband, but ultimately the final say is in the husband, right? So the, this yes. is kind of like the different approaches. So as the husband, um, you should be listening to, you know, what the the person you've been one body with is saying and, and take, you know, her view into account and to consider it important. But at the end of the day, you also have the responsibility to kind of make the decisions as well. So you yes. kind of bear the brunt of the responsibility. And another thing that St. Gregory Theologian says, and, lot, and this might shock a lot of people, because a lot of people have this idea that the early church uh, or the kind of like the ancient times, early medieval times, you know, there was no such thing as equal, you know, egalitarianism or feminism. You know, people didn't think of such things. In fact, a lot of these ideas were presented within the nobility. So the commoners... Yeah oppose these kinds of ideas it was the nobility who kind of were preaching a lot of these ideas and one of the things that saint Gregory, the theologian says in his letter is that you shall set aside the silliness of equality among the sexes that some of your contemporaries preach so saint Gregory, the theologian is a fourth century saint which means that even in the fourth century there are people who were talking about egalitarianism and feminism yeah. people were aware of these kinds of ideas and they thought these ideas were ridiculous, especially people like St. Gregory the Theologian, all of these philosophers and theologians of their time, primarily for metaphysical reasons, right? Because it didn't really make sense within the natural order, and this is why it must be opposed. And so he, he says that, uh, you, sh you know, he says, set aside the silliness of equality among the sexes that some of your contemporaries preach and attempt to comprehend the obligations of marriage. In the realization of these obligations, you will discover the great patience and endurance that is necessary to fulfill your family duties. It is in this manner that you will also discover the great strength that you as a woman possess. So I think a lot of what kind of like the, the patriarchist pe uh, people online say, it's kind of what people back then did, right? The woman looked after the woman uh, nurtured and looked after the children, and even looked after the husband, right? Yes. You can kind of say it in that sense. And the husband provided the, uh, financial, economical, and kind of the, the the needs of the family, and bore that responsibility. Um, which you know, both responsibilities are when you think about the consequence of it is very scary, right? I mean, if you're a man, right. you have to kind of think, okay, um, if I mess it up here and there, you know, I'm going to um, I'm I'm not going to be able to fulfill my duties. And as a woman, you kind of have to think, okay, I, I have to be patient, I have to be humble, I have to be loving. I have to, you know, I have to understand the fact that I might get things that I don't deserve, right? Receive treatments that I don't deserve at the very least temporarily. But it is the kind of struggle that I will go through. And for the man, it is a struggle that he will go through that sometimes um, he might not receive the love that he expects. Sometimes he might not be able to be successful as he wants in order to provide for his family. Both have uh, different responsibilities and roles to play and different means of achieving, again, the same virtues right and this is why it's important to be humble it's important to be loving it's important to be patient for both sides for in some senses it's more important for the woman in some other sense it's more important for the man and this is kind of i will say an ex is a is, is an example of the different roles that men and women played throughout all of history i mean yeah. this whole idea of feminism it's very new right the way it exists today it's it's it's, it's incredibly new and one of the things that people uh, say is that, that I find very funny is, uh, you know, men oppressed women and didn't allow women to rise up and take control for themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And right. you kind of have to ask, okay, why, why didn't women just rise up? Why didn't women take the control themselves? Is it because for example, they might be physically weak and 
you know, they might have less <laughs> capacities in hand-eye coordination, which is important for agility and strength in order to, you know, combat, you know, the rest of the male population? Is it because there's certain cap capacities of women, even though superior to men in some senses, inferior is inferior in other senses that, again, yeah. is about taking a physical and violent responsibility in a, in a sense? Yeah, that's probably why that never happened. And there's a reason why nature has run its course in this manner. It's because that's how that's the natural relationship between men and women is. And what we see today is, a, is an upending of that natural relationship. And you know, we must not forget the reason why there's this relationship today is because of the relation between Adam and Eve, uh, Adam and Eve. And that because Eve trampled upon the authority of Adam and because Adam did not fulfill the responsibility that he had, this is the state that men and women are in, right? This is why yes. another reason why God commanded Adam to kind of have power over the wife and kind of the wife to have different roles. When I say power, I don't mean in, in some oppressive sense, but kind of, you know, hierarchical responsibility and such, right? So that's kind of what yeah, I mean. so actually that, a long history of this. That reminds me, um, I just did another live stream with somebody where we were talking about um, famous simps in history. <laughs> and one of the stories I went back and read, because I'm thinking, I was thinking of different, you know, stories throughout history that kind of illustrate the warning of why you shouldn't simp because you know i get this accusation thrown at me that i hate women and that i for some reason that i just you know want to see women be oppressed uh, and that's not the reason i do this at all it's because i actually think that all this women's liberation stuff is poison to women i think it's there as a barrier to salvation and that it's extremely destructive to women not it's destructive to men it's destructive to children too but it's terrible for women so i went back and i thought i i'm gonna reread the story of samson and delilah from the book of judges and i don't know this is something that's been happening to me ever since i you know i found orthodoxy and got an orthodox study bible and i go back and read it and it's like i don't know how i didn't see this before but I thought this was amazing. So in the story of Samson and Delilah, uh, Samson is in this town. He's this like extremely powerful enemy of the people in the town he's in. And so they get a woman to try to seduce him and find out what his weakness is so they can defeat him. And at first he, he's really into her. And at first he's resistant. So she asks the power of like, how, how are you so strong? How can you be defeated? And he tells her a lie. And she tries to get his enemies to kill him with it and it doesn't work. And she's like, oh, you lied to me. Tell me, tell me, I'm going to ask a second time. You need to tell me what the secret is to your power. So he lies to her again. And these people try to defeat him with that lie and it doesn't work again. And this is so funny. She said, this is um, from Judges 16, uh, verse 15. She says to Samson, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You deceived me a third time and you have not yet told me where your great, great strength lies. And it came to pass after she pestered him continually with her words and pressured him sorely that his spirit failed him almost to death. So in case you guys didn't know, the, the woman pestering the man to the point that he's like about to die, that's a story as old as time, apparently. So I thought that was really interesting wording. But finally, he breaks down and tells her, right? He finally kind of, and in doing so, he kind of betrays God because God has only given him this strength and power so that he can conquer the enemies of Israel. And so when he betrays the Lord by simping and breaking down and giving this woman the secret to his strength, his enemies are able to subdue him. You know, she cuts off his hair. They capture him. They take his eyes out. And it says uh, in this next verse, uh, but he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. So the Lord actually turned from him when he did this because it was such a dereliction of his duty to let the woman kind of usurp his authority that it led to the ruin not only of Samson, but of Delilah herself. And he brings down the entire, you know, temple house that that he's being held in and kills all the people inside. Um, and it, it's kind of like this tale we hear over and over in the Bible and in the church that when you let women kind of beg and pester and prod their way into uh, things that aren't for them. And when the men let it, that slip and let that slide, we see it with Adam, we see it with Sam, with Samson. And I think there's a few other stories that are kind of similar to this, where when men 
give up that authority, the Lord kind of allows the ruination that comes with it, right? So for me, like I'm thinking about how the Catholics are are about to consider female clergy. We see the Protestant world who has had female clergy for a long time. Male attendance in Protestant American churches is at an all-time low. All-time low. Men don't go to church anymore because they go and they hear the sermon. And the sermon on Mother's Day is always how wonderful women are and we should all step up and do more for the women. And then the sermon on Father's Day is always going to be about how we still need to have men step up and do more and be better and and do more for the women. And so the men are kind of checking out. I mean, the Protestant churches allow divorce on a wide scale. It's like you can have three, four, five divorces in most Protestant churches in America these days. They've got female clergy, they got female board members, and it's it's led to ruin for the church. It's led to ruin for the women, the children, and the men. So I think, I mean, if you are a Protestant, you love your Bible, right? If you if it's scripture alone and you and the Bible is your authority, there's I mean, Tim Gordon is Catholic, but he's fabulous at he's got like every scripture there is warning against female authority in the church and that and the proper role of women in the church and the protestants will just ignore it and we have stories like adam and eve samson and delilah we have saint paul himself saying you know women are to be quiet in the church they should cover their head they are not to be preaching from the pulpit as david just said and it's like i don't know how they can just completely hand wave all that and say yeah but it's modern times and and we have to change with the times and i'll hear this argument that it's for the needs of the church so I don't know if you have any thoughts on my big ramble there. But. Well, I will say, I mean, I pretty much agree with everything you pointed out. I mean, people need to realize that even if hypothetically speaking, women had the exact same, you know, intellectual and physical capacity, um, as, as, if, as long as there is a genuine distinction between the sexes and as, as long as there are certain roles that different sexes have to naturally play in accordance to their nature, then we have to kind of take a hard line stance and understand, okay, there's, you can do this and you can't do this, right? Even if your child happened to be a super genius who understood everything, your child should still not tell you, okay, hey, father, let's go live in Bolivia because we can make a lot of money there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're yeah. not going to really, I mean, um, even if he laid out like the perfect arguments, I mean, you are the one who has authority <laughs> over him at the end of the day, right? If, right? if the child ended up telling everything that the father had to do, then it will be bad for the child because then he will not understand and learn about kind of responsibility that he had and it will hinder his own development. Or similarly, uh, men, again, are physically completely and utterly incapable of being mothers they cannot be mothers and under any capacity it's impossible for men to be mothers just like it's impossible for women to be fathers and it's impossible for also to be for them to play the role of you know mother and father irrespectively and the the biblical story you talked about with Samson and Delilah, um, St. John Chrysostom says in his uh, 13th homily on St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, he says about biblical women that they were great characters, great women and admirable, admirable, yet did they in, in no case outstrip the men but occupied the second rank. So what St. John Chrysostom is saying is that um, he's not, so he is what he's not saying. He is not saying that great women were still lesser in every single way than bad men. Right. He's not saying that. What he is saying is that great women, in fact, you know, he will say that these women are greater than the men that they were below in, in terms of, you know, if, if there's a bad man that they were below that kind of did horrible things, um, they understood the, the role that they played, naturally speaking, that was ordained by God, and they were great at it, and this is what made them great, right? So, and remember what Christ says, right? The least will be first, and the first will be least. And this is why a lot of people really need to kind of disassemble their dialectical thinking on this matter, because I think this is kind of the source in which a lot of people have in looking at gender relations. And the, the moment they see, again, the moment a lot of feminists and egalitarians, they see difference, they see either superiority or inferiority. There yes. cannot be just merely different expressions. 
And this is kind of the problem with egalitarianism is that at the end of the day, egalitarianism is just trying to make hum all human beings equal in every single sense and explaining the differences by uh, societal expectations and laws. So when they see, for example, men making more money than women, they don't say, oh, you know, may, uh, it's because, that, because of men being more capable at doing X, Y, Z, right? They don't say that because they already assume that is impossible. So they already have that assumption. So they see this discrepancy. The only conclusion that left is that, well, there is unfair circumstances applied to women and we need to change that. So we need to yes. change that order, right? But right. the problem here with this view is essentially the presupposition, right? The presupposition of egalitarianism is what needs to be done away with uh, in order to be, to be able to have a proper look at the world. And it, again, with biblical women and biblical men, you, you see this uh, being the case, right? You know, even if a man happens to play a perfect role of being feminine, th <laughs> that he's still not being a man. He's still um, moving away from what he's supposed to be. And this is what sin is, right? Sin is right. missing the mark. It's moving away from what is in proper accordance with the order that God has established within nature and also within you, that you are to have a natural affiliation to and to follow. So that's, it's the, again, the issue isn't about whether women are really good at being priests or really bad at being priests or whether women are good or bad at X. It's about what a woman is, what a man is, what is the relationship between men and women. That is the question at hand. So um, I will advise people to kind of start thinking in this fashion. And the way you find answers to this is ultimately uh, reading scripture, reading the church fathers, and even reading about at least not to the same extent that some people do, but you know, reading a little bit about um, Trinitarian theology because you can actually find answers there as well. Because one of the things that I remember uh, kind of shocking me is when I understood this kind of relationship in, in the Trinity where you know the Father is greater than the Son by cause, but they're also identical in terms of nature, it kind of solved the question of, you know, how can men and women be different while also equal at the same time? Well, this is the foundation of reality, which is God himself already gives the answer to this question. I think you can kind of find the answers to different questions on uh, by looking at God himself and who God is. And, and in a sense, what he is in accordance with what he reflects about uh, himself. Yes, that is so well said. And I think that's a really key point for people to understand. I also totally agree with you about this. Like, this is something that I'm up against all the time too, is this dialectical thinking that we have. And a lot of this comes out of like post enlightenment and also Marxist thinking, which is have then been the predominant things in the West specifically for the last few hundred years, where if I say, or you say men and women uh, have different purposes they have different roles they they uh have they're not the same people's initial knee-jerk response to that is so you're saying one's better than the other right and it's like well which is better a hammer or a screwdriver i mean nobody's saying one is inherently better or more valuable that one is superior and one is inferior but it's people have a hard time thinking outside of this red team blue team uh, you know, conservative, progressive, kind of like dialectical thinking that we is our paradigm, especially here in America. I feel like it's just so pervasive. And the other thing that I wanted to agree with you on is that these ideas are not new. Like this, when you said there were ancient aristocrats, you know, proposing egalitarianism, the whole reason I wrote this little thing here was to go over that. And it starts in ancient times with uh, temple priestesses and pagan worship and all of the other religious traditions that had temple prostitutes and priestess, priestesses and things like this and how Christianity, you know, some of our critics will say, well, Christianity is bad because it's a patriarchal religion. And that's true. They're right. But patriarchy has been uh, bastardized literally into this like bad thing, this pr oppressor oppressed narrative of the men just holding the women down for the purposes of control so they can enslave us and have us as sex toys or something. And if you read the church fathers and you look into church history and start reading these things, you'll see they did not have this view of women as slaves. They had this view of women as 
holy mothers, like the, the Theotokos is supposed to be our example because she was kind of all things to women. She was both a virgin and a mother. Like what an amazing typology of the virtues for women. She's, you know, the symbol of a mother and she's also the symbol of a virgin. She's the Ark of the New Covenant. She's has to consent to, you know, she she says, let it be me. She says, okay, I will take this on. Even though she's in a time where an unwed pregnant 14 year old, she knows what, <laughs> what that's going to kind of entail and things like this. So uh, to, to see patriarchy as inherently oppressive to women is a false presupposition. To see, um, you know, all men throughout history, to have this crazy belief that all men throughout all time have had mothers, grandmothers, sisters, wives, daughters, that they were just getting up every day and wondering how to keep them down doesn't even make sense. Why, why would men throughout all of history fight and die to protect the women in their lives, but also want to oppress and control them? So it's really not about that. You have to, if you want to understand how things work and if you want to have like a happy marriage and if you want to have peace in your life and be part of the church, you have to start thinking outside of these dialectical false presuppositions that make you think the world is a certain way when it's not. So that's, I guess that's what we're here doing. Um, but what do you think about, so when people say, well, why can't women be altar servers? Um, I, I saw this amazing presentation from an, uh, this group of Orthodox women who do want more female participation in the church. And I tried to be very charitable and I thought maybe it won't be so bad. I'm just going to sit in on their zoom meeting and maybe, you know, maybe it won't be so bad. And it was way worse than I thought. <laughs> it was way worse than I thought. And they had this woman who's a neurosurgeon uh, saying that she could look at brain scans and see that when you don't give women what they want, it makes them depressed. It causes them physical torture to not give them what they want. Therefore, if they want to be altar servers, if they feel called to be altar servers or to be deaconesses, you have to let them because otherwise you are harming them because you're upsetting them by not giving them what they want. And I was just like, wow, I was kind of expecting more. I was kind of hoping they would have like some actual arguments, but this was the level of silliness I was getting out of this group. But all the women thought this was a great argument. To make women upset is to is to fundamentally physically damage their brain. So if they want to do, you have to let them do what they want. So what do you think about women who make this argument that what if I feel called to, to be a deaconess? What if I feel that the Lord is calling me to be a priest, a priestess? What what is, what should we well, respond with? Well, I mean, the basic response is just because you feel called doesn't mean that you're actually called your feelings are not the objective metric in what you should be doing with your life and in fact if anything it's the opposite I and mean, this is all throughout uh, orthodox spiritual teaching that part of deception uh, you know deception comes from uh, trusting in oneself too much right in in other words trusting your senses too much and for example a lot of people who do a lot of drugs uh, they will see a lot of these like spiritual sites and then they will say, well, I, see, I saw this spiritual, I had this spiritual experience and it was telling me that I should, I don't know, that I should do some African rituals where I lay out, you know, the feces of multiple people and I just eat them. That's what, that's what the, that's what the spirit demon is telling me and I should just do it. You know, that, <laughs> that doesn't mean that you should do it just because you saw a vision like that. I mean, the, deception is something real and deception is the job of, um, satan, you know, evil satanic beings who are against God. And the whole point of what uh, Satan and his minions are trying to do is he's trying to pull you away from God. And he's doing this by the means of deceptions in the same way that he deceived Eve, right? Uh, and in, in turn, which he deceived Adam as well. So this whole stuff about, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really strange about like, oh, you know, woman, you should do what women want to do. I mean, should you do everything a child also wants to do? Like if a child wants to eat a bunch of, you know, uh, ice cream, she'll just let him say, okay, yeah, you can eat, eat all the ice cream that you want um, just because you feel like it. And if you don't, you're going to start crying. I mean, it's, it's really strange. And it kind of takes away the responsibility out of the equation where, um, you know, the aim of life ends up just becoming, okay, I want to do what I want to do. 
right? Yeah. And irrespective of what I should really be doing, in respect, irrespective of my responsibilities. And I mean, the consequence of this is very fatal because at the end of the day, you're going to have a society of people that will move away from their responsibilities and they will just do things that they want. This is the easiest way that you end up getting a societal collapse, a total societal collapse. Yes. The world runs on people who fulfill their obligations and responsibilities. And it will fall away if people just end up being like children. I mean, this is, again, the, the presentation you're talking about, it's like, you know, these women are kind of being like children. You know, I, I want to do this. And if you don't give me what I want, I am going to cry and I'm going to go, Wah! you know. That's... I'll be sad. The women oh, yeah. can't be unhappy. Well, I, that's why it was so You don't want to make a woman sad. That's Anything horrible. Like that. <laughs> they they really think that's the worst possible outcome that could ever happen in life. Um, so I was I was disappointed because I was hoping I would have like I was hoping they would challenge me with something that I really had to like come up with a good argument against. And I was like, oh, it's kind of disappointing. But my husband did this debate the other day where they were talking about divorce, and one of the people on the panel said, "But shouldn't we?" care about if people are happy because my husband's arguing we should have higher barriers to entry and exit for divorce because if it's super easy to get married and super easy to get divorced, divorce nobody takes it seriously everyone's focused on their rights nobody's focused on their duties and this is the problem right and the one of the other fellows said well but shouldn't we what about people's happiness and i was thinking well first of all uh Try measuring people's happiness. I mean, this is the problem with like utilitarianism, right? This idea that we can quantify well-being with some kind of calculus metrics. And then we just, we determine morality based on what makes people the happiest or, or well-being, these kind of things. And Christianity is a story filled with people who made extraordinary sacrifices, for the glory of God. They didn't do what made them happy. We do, The saints of our church are not saints because they did what made them feel good and what made them happy. They often were tortured and killed. They were martyred um, and they made great personal sacrifice. I mean, St. Monica was um, St. Augustine's mother and he had a very uh, kind of degenerate lifestyle earlier in his life, and he was not a faithful guy. And she prayed unceasingly for like 30 years or something for his conversion. And eventually he did come to the church and become a saint. And so it's like, why do women not see the power of being a mother as something desirable, but they, they do want political authority? They want church authority? I think it's because the power we have as women often comes with a lot of sacrifice, which we know as Christians is good for our salvation. But I think these women are, are aiming towards very worldly goals where they want to feel validated. They want to feel important. They want people to look at them with authority and with, you know, worldly power. And to me, I, I understand that if you're a secularist, like I, I feel like as a secularist, OK, sure. Why not? But if you're a Christian woman, I don't know how you're making these arguments that I should be happy. This is about me and me being happy, because if that's what you want, I mean, I don't know that Christianity is the place for you. I mean, happiness, yes, but but not through getting what we want in a worldly way, not through, um, you know, making others sacrifice. You know, they're will to me, they're willing to sacrifice the church because they feel like they need to be happy. They're like, but I'm in the church and I need to be happy. Also, there's two big, huge meta studies that were done that I'm writing a piece on right now, which show that women are never happy. So <laughs> that, that might be for another day, but it, they really did. They had this uh, big 2009 study called the Paradox of Female Happiness that that was trying to explore this weird conundrum of why to, the more women are liberated, the less happy they report being, the more depression, the more alcohol abuse, just the less happiness they report. You know, like the women of the 60s reported pretty good happiness in America. And then when they pulled them again through the 80s and 90s, they were miserable. And they they said, this is very bizarre. So they did a big study. It caused a big kerfuffle. And then a few years ago, a different team of researchers kind of repeated and expanded on the study and looked at other cultures. They looked at other time frames to try to see like, okay, is this just an American anomaly of the last few decades? And they found no. In fact, in the in the conclusion, like in the abstract summary, they said, 
Women are just highly disposed to negative emotion. They feel negative emotion far more strongly than men. They just tend to have a lot of emotional volatility. It could be their hormone cycle. It could be their brain structure. It could be any number of things that causes it. But we do find that women generally just aren't very happy. And it doesn't seem to matter what time, place, or culture they're in. This seems to be the way. So to me, it's like to, to base what we're doing in the church or society on women's happiness, which is such a fleeting, hard to define thing anyway, is literal insanity. And like you said, it's the fastest way to a collapse. Yeah. And you also have to kind of define happiness here as well. I mean, happiness, what happiness in the sense of dopamine increase or happiness in the sense of being self-assured? Well, being self-assured or achieving some kind of eudaimonia, as Aristotle will say, that is achieved not by a dopamine boost alone. You're supposed to do, you know, fulfilling your responsibilities, um, acquiring certain excellences like virtues, right? I mean, these are part of becoming eudaimonic, becoming self-assured, and which means that in order to be able to do these things, you're going to have to fulfill the responsibilities and the role that you're supposed to fill in life, which kind of refutes the whole idea of like, you know, I should just be happy and that's, I just want to achieve maximum happiness. And obviously there's, there's a bigger problem. And I think your husband will also make this point. And I think a lot of people will make this point is that, well, you know, if I want to do something that's insane, like, um, I don't know, like steal from a bank or steal from people or do what a lot of these, you know, the, the you know, there's this like Somali guy in Japan who's like causing kerfuffle all, and just like causing chaos all over the place who, mm -hmm. um, you know, definitely should be booted from Japan, right? That guy, I mean, that makes him happy. Yeah. Uh, why are you not, stop, you know, should he not do what he wants to do? Because that makes him happy, yeah, right? Heroin At the end of the day. Addicts happy. Heroin oh, addicts yeah, love heroin. It makes them very happy. But does that mean we should just give it to them or... Actually, yes. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> well, you, uh, <laughs> I mean, the consequences of this is that you do see people arguing for that. Yeah, we should give them free needles. We should we should facilitate the addiction just in a safer way, you know. And this is this is kind of how I see the the argument for uh, taking the church, which has this amazing tradition and has so far remained not of the world but in the world. And, and going, well, it's got to change with the times and we have to let the women in and they should be priests because uh, they can do it as well. Like you said, it's this argument of, well, they can do just as good a job as men. But it's like, even if that were the case, I would dispute that for many reasons. Yeah. But even if it were the case, that doesn't that doesn't necessitate an ought claim that we ought to make women clergy. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's it kind of gets to this whole point about you know, what is happiness and what kind of happiness should we pursue? And when it comes to kind of general gender roles that we that we want to consider, one of the things that you pointed out, again, is that a lot of women are uh, a lot more unhappy. And I think hormone cycles have a big role to play on this, but I'm not a I'm not a female bi biology expert by any means. But uh, I think a lot of people really, really underestimate the effects of that. And in, in other words, at the same time, I mean, we're in this unprecedented social state of female liberation mm -hmm. where women have the possibility to do many different things. And yet their their happiness, their their own reported happiness is down the drain, right? And you yeah. also have to objectively think about what's going on. I mean, what are they doing that they couldn't do prior to? Well, instead of being obedient to a man that they love, they are now being obedient to a stranger uh, that's going to give them money for completing tasks. I'm sure that's a very different <laughs> uh, reality that they definitely will love to have. And on top of that, they're going to have to do a lot of things that's just, that's just not fit for them to do, generally speaking, putting themselves in a much more difficult situation. I mean, try um, try uh, making try making an expert esports player out of a man who misses an arm. You're definitely going to have a lot of success with that, right? I mean, it's kind of kind of like that. Uh, so there's a reason why, and, and I'm kind of talking about the whole like pragmatic angle here. Right. Yeah. So I'm kind of moving away from metaphysics and kind of just like a pragmatic angle. There's Again, there's a reason why human history has had patriarchal societies up until very recently. And we can we can all very clearly see that, you know, this kind of 
the structure of patriarchy and the establishment of egalitarian feminism. It's very clearly a a non-natural movement, right? It's not something that human beings themselves wanted to have. It was a top-down movement uh, that was imposed on the people and established by various different me media propaganda and so on and so forth. It's not something that is established naturally. And when we look at history again, we see patriarchy all over the place. Yes, people can count some matriarchy in Africa, but, <laughs> you know, who cares at the end of the yeah. day? I mean, I'll just say it, who cares? Uh, yeah. When you look at all of the great civilizations that had a lot to contribute to the world, it's all patriarchy. And even in England, where you had some queens at the time, and, and this is kind of an interesting study that people uh, that people might be surprised because a lot of people have this understanding that uh, wars are caused by male aggression and testosterone, right? So if women ended up leading, we'd have less wars. Well, actually, they did a study of female leaders in contrast to male leaders in yep. history. And it's the exact opposite. It's the exact yes. opposite. It happens to be the case that men are actually uh, better at being peacemakers, whereas female leaders are, you know, cause more wars, right? And yes. I, I don't think it's that simplistic as this uh, research suggests, but it does strongly show that there is, it's not as what people think, right? Yes. So people really, again, a lot of people who are feminists and egalitarians, they really need to think about this at the end of the day. I mean, why has human society for its entire existence operated under this way? And why did women, you know, what do women really want to have? And another thing that people need to think, and this applies to both men and women, right? So it applies all across the board, because there's also men that like feminism and egalitarianism, etc. So they think it's good and all that kind of stuff. They need to consider something. Do people really know what they want and what is good for them? And if you ask a lot of people who innovate things, right, like people who come up with <laughs> iPhones or you know new computers and things like this, they will consistently tell you, and this is something that people who are interested in economics and finance and innovation, they will all know this right, very clearly, that they will tell you that if you give people what they want, like what they explicitly want, they will always be disappointed. Yes. If you give people what they really want, but they just don't know what they want, because that's how it operates, people don't really know what they want or what they need, then they will be pleased. They will be pleased a lot more right and that's kind of the whole point of innovation and i will also say this kind of applies to both men and women a lot of people think they want complete equality because of right. certain presuppositions they have but they don't realize that this is actually the last thing they need and they don't even really yeah. want this it's the same thing again with women and you point this out a lot um women don't want to uh, be financially beholden to a stranger right they don't want to live a life like that but they, in a sense, want a life. They, they say they want a want life that like that, but they don't, right? They actually right. prefer motherhood, right? And just because modern men and modern motherhood, in their perspective, doesn't look as good as it, as they, as they ideally will like it to have, doesn't mean that it should be completely abandoned, right? Because at the end of the day. Once you destroy an institution just because the people that's playing the roles aren't playing it perf perfectly, you're not necessarily going to get something much better. People really need yeah. to understand. And I want to give one example. I'm sorry for rambling, but no, I want to give one ahead. example. Uh, in Greece, uh, Alexis Tsipras, who lost two elections, ended up resigning. And a lot of people were happy because he resigned. And I'm not a fan of this guy. I think he's a socialist. And I think most Greeks will... Most Greeks should not like media, but I'm just giving an example, right? And, you know, the more kind of, you know, leftist, but somewhat sense, you know, sensible Greeks, you know, they wanted him gone. So he was gone, right? And he was kind of this establishment guy. And the person who came in place of him um, is a total internationalist, globalist shill who is, uh, he's not married, but he has this kind of, I think, agreement with his boyfriend. <laughs> so basically they got a gay guy instead. And I'm pretty sure a lot of the sensible Greek people are now thinking, yeah, I actually prefer the previous guy. I mean, now we got a worse guy. And, and you can have that situation is yeah. what I'm trying to say. I mean, you're trying to get rid of a bad thing, but you might end up getting something much worse. Yes. So what you should think is that, okay, I want to keep the institution that's part of human life and order, but we should actually have it fulfill the proper roles it has, right? So 
just because they're bad fathers does not mean patriarchy is bad, right? Just because yes. there are good matriarchs doesn't mean matriarchy is good right. uh, for the same reason. Yes, absolutely. I agree with all of that. Um, I think that's exactly what's happened. Uh, I think feminism was packaged in a way that it was going to solve all the problems of like, what about bad men though, right? But what about when men are bad? Uh, if we just have feminism, it'll fix that. And it turns out that feminism actually enables bad men even more because now the good men can't step in and do anything really about the bad men, which is why you see like that Substack piece I wrote a couple months ago. It goes over all the data of how actually the most abusive relationships women can end up in are lesbian relationships and relationships where they're cohabitating and relationships where it's some person who is not the biological father of their children, but is living in their home. These are the worst situations. And to back up your point about the uh, women rulers being more likely to start wars, that is true. And there's also a ton of data about like female prison guards being far more abusive, both sexually and physically in every way that you can imagine, than male prison guards are. I think part of that is that Young boys, when they grow up and they're doing like rough and tumble play and they're fighting with their dad or their friends or their brothers, they figure out that they can hurt people. They realize, oh, I, if I lose my temper, if I let if I let my self-control go a little bit, I can do some damage I didn't mean to do. And they learn a little bit more how to restrain that. And there's always the threat between men that either of us could kill each other if it came to that, right? Women don't have that dynamic with each other. And women don't have that dynamic with men growing up. And so I think they're much more likely to use force and force multipliers to get what they want when they have authority because they don't, they're not as experienced in <clears throat> understanding how badly that can go wrong. Um, so just that as an aside, but let's talk a little bit before we go to questions. Guys, send your questions to the dono chat. It's pinned at the top of the chat. You can also send a YouTube super chat if you like to give them money. Um, <laughs> and we'll ask David any of your hot burning questions about orthodoxy and, and all the topics today, any questions that you guys have. And uh, what about apostolic succession? What about the fact that Christ gave the apostles as bishops the power to remit and retain sins? Why did he not establish? I know he had Mary Magdalene. He had the myrrh bearing women. It's not that Christ didn't have important women in his ministry, but why did he establish apostolic succession among when and among men? And can that be handed down to women? Yeah, I think the answer to this question is kind of a repetition of the kind of answer on why women can't be clergy. At the end of the day, um, apostolic succession, the, the office of the clergy, right? The point of the office of the clergy is to establish the the order and society of God and the city of God, in a sense, on earth and the community of God um, and giving that mission of God to human beings to continue that till the end of time, right? And so, so epistolic succession is also kind of this response against death, right? Human beings die, but the succession lives on till the end of the ages. And this is what Christ says, right? Christ says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, meaning that the that the church is not going to die. It's not going to succumb before uh, the end of end of all time. And this, you know, the apostles, the, the clergy is a continuation of the apostolic office, right? The apostolic office of bishop. And you also then have priests, right? And Christ as the high priest. And you also have deacons. And the clerical office is a reflection of God's divine hierarchy within the relation that father has as the father source, that is the patriarch, right? Patriarch, father source of the son. And so the bishop is, is the father source of the priest, right? And Christ also likewise is the high priest, right? And so th there's this kind of relation between the father and the son reflected in, uh, in the church as bishop and priest. And this is the apostolic office and the reason why men uh you know it, men are continuing this apostolic ministry is because only men can be clergy and women definitely cannot be clergy so i i will say that kind of is to kind of restate my previous answer i think that will be my response to this and 
as I said, it's, it's kind of this response against death and it's to continue the ministry of Christ on earth with the power of the Holy Spirit, of course, right? And this is yeah. the, the whole idea of the book of Acts. I mean, to summarize the book of Acts, it's the Holy Spirit's presence within human beings in continuing what Christ completed on earth, which is the incarnation, the ministry, and his crucifixion and the resurrection. The whole point of the book of Acts and Epstock succession is to continue that to the end of time uh, working synergistically with uh, human beings and God, right? God and men working synergistically. Right. And Christ, this is an important thing too for a lot of my Protestant friends out there. I don't mean to, I don't mean to give you guys a hard time. I love you very much, but it's, it's something that I didn't ever hear in my Protestant church growing up. And I didn't really understand until orthodoxy was Christ when he incarnated was a fully human person in, in a certain historical place and time. Okay, this is why we don't have icons of Korean Jesus or African Jesus or, like David said, female Jesus, because Christ was an actual person. He was a historical person. So if he was a historically male person and he is the priest in the order of Melchizedek who passed though that power on to the apostles, it's hard to imagine that there's a good argument for now, 2,000 years later, trying to squeeze women into that somehow, trying to take human woman and, and cram her into this order. Am I right there? Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, will, I will agree that Christ is fully human, um, though in a, in a sense, like I will say that he's, a, he's, he's not a separate human person, right? But right. he's a divine right. person. Um, that fully has human nature in himself yes. in the sense you can say he can be said as a human person in that manner, but that's yes. a different that's a different subject, right? Right. right. So we, we, we're talking kind, we're talking loosely though. here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're yeah. talking loosely here, right? In, in a in a sense, but uh, with the incarnation, something to consider again, the incarnation is is very key because it's Christ's assumption of human nature, and Christ yes. um, didn't assume some kind of like. Uh, just merely generic unisex human nature. He assumed human nature in the male form. And right. so uh, he sanctifies and heals both men and women. But when he takes the priestly office, right, the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, as you pointed out, he does so in a uniquely male manner, right? Yes. And so uh, Christ and, and Christ is eternally man. He's still a human being after the ascension. He's eternally human. And he has an hypostatized, that, that is, he has particularized his humanity in a uniquely male man with respect to the priestly office, which is another reason why the priestly office is exclusively male. So I will kind of support your argument in that way. Awesome. Good. That's why I have you here, because you can make sure that I'm what I'm saying is correct. And theologically, you have to have precision in these things, because this is something I've learned over the last few years. If you're not precise in how you talk about these things, you can make fatal errors without meaning to, which is why I don't come on here and and do any of this by myself. I always have you or, you know, Father Deacon or somebody who is authorized and, and well educated to make sure that I anything I'm saying is not wrong. So let's go and see if anybody has any questions for us in the dono chat first. Uh, we do have a couple. So, okay, Rigovich sent $5. Thank you, Rigovich, for the $5. And he says, I just want to support my favorite Orthodox peeps. I'm cooking while listening, thinking of a question. Okay, awesome. That sounds good. I'm always cooking. It's so funny to me when people, I'll be on Twitter and people are like, get back in the kitchen where you belong. And I'm like, too late, already there. I'm just tweeting in between flipping the bacon. So relax. Um, so good job being in the kitchen. Uh, Petrogard sends us $5 also. Thank you, Petrogard, for the $5. And he says, when does your book get an audio version? Will it be on Audible or somewhere else? Well, it is. Did you not know that? It does have an audiobook version. It is on Audible. Um, it's, I will say though, it's a lot harder to get a good audiobook producer than you would ever think. I had to do this is the second time I've had it done, and it's much better than the first. But I have a different person in mind already for the next book who's gonna who's gonna read it. But the the one that's there is solid. So if you want the audiobook, you can go to Audible. It should be there. If you go to Amazon, you should there should be a link to buy it there. So 
enjoy the audiobook. Um, do you guys in the chat who did not send a dono chat have any questions, like specific questions about this particular topic? Let's see. Um, do, do, do. Yes, Petrograd, it is. Okay, he said he's going to go get it. Awesome. Um, I did see like a little bit of people back and forth in the chat kind of arguing with a, a lady who had questions. I don't know, but she she seems like she's kind of confused. I don't know if there are relevant questions to this. Oh, question. Does the panel believe Mother Mary is the Queen of Heaven? Well, it, that, that question can be answered in the sense that, first of all, I will say that the Virgin Mary is the Mother of God because Christ is God, right? She gave birth to the person, Jesus Christ, who is God. Um, so... I will add that detail as well. In terms of the Queen of Heaven, that's a terminology that comes in the Old Testament, but the idea behind it is actually quite biblical. Um, so the whole point is that in Israel, um, the Queen Mother, in a sense, ruled with the King, right? Uh, and Christ, who, who is the King of Heaven, right? He is. He is. He is the King figure, right? He fulfills the role of prophet, priest, and king of uh, prophet David. And so the Virgin Mary being his mother is in that sense, uh, the queen of heaven. But one of the things that we need to understand is a lot of people kind of have this idea that the Virgin Mary is this kind of like different figure, like separate figure in Christianity who a lot of people have this like weird adherence to. Uh, we venerate the Virgin Mary in, in relation that she has with Christ, right? So, when we say that she's the mother of God, that's not a term that specifically, ex it's, it's a term that exalts her, of course. It's also biblical because she's called the mother of my Lord, right? In Luke 143, I believe so. And Lord is a divine title, so there you go. But she's called the mother of God in order to attest to the divinity of Christ, right? And so she's called the queen of heaven in order to attest to the kingship of Christ because of the relation that she has with Christ. And one of the things we need to understand with the ascension is that Christ already is ascended to the, he's already equal to the father and his divinity. The ascension is the ascension of Christ's humanity so that we too ascend to the right hand of the father and rule with the father, right? So it's not just the Virgin Mary that's ruling with Christ. It's also the saints that are ruling with Christ. And this is the idea of divine counsel. It's in Psalm 82, right? God rules amongst the gods. And Christ explains that, you know, yes, the in, in the Bible, some of the gods, lower lowercase g gods are angels. They're not God in the sense of having the same nature, but they are, they have, they have that title in a sense, lowercase g God, right? It yeah. also refers to human beings as Christ himself says, right? He says, I said, ye are gods, right? And this is in reference to human beings who have the word of God come to them and who listen to the word of God and live in accordance with them. Those are the saints and they rule with God, right? They rule in synergy with God. And uh, Mary is the queen and Christ is the king, right? So this is the kind of idea of um, Mary as the queen of heaven. Uh, though I will say that the Roman Catholics, again, with like Marian veneration in, in a lot of senses, they take it to a very extreme level at yes. times, right? Like with uh, the Virgin Mary as being this co-redemptrix figure. Right. Um, whereas we as Orthodox, we kind of take a more, I will say, a balanced view of Virgin Mary, we recognize her humanity and the participation of the divine life. Uh, but we don't go to the extreme of kind of like trying to make her identical with God's operas. I mean, um, Max Kolb like goes as far as to say that the Holy Spirit is quasi incarnated in the Virgin Mary. I mean, that's like that's ridiculous. I mean, we don't believe that. No. Right? Uh, we don't believe the Virgin Mary has equal authority as God has. I mean, any authority that she has, it's from the grace of God. That right. all saints and all Christians participate in uh, right. if they live in accordance with God. Um, so that's something that people have to bear in mind. So we have a so I, and I'm pointing this out so that people don't misunderstand our beliefs and think that we are, you know, worshiping a human being yes. or anything I'm so ridiculous glad that, like that. I'm so glad that you clarified that because that's one of the number one things that like bless all your hearts if you just don't know. If you really don't know any theology, that's fine. Most people don't. I understand that's not like most people aren't theology ner nerds who are going to like read all of this and understand all the nuance and everything. But I get that a lot from people who are like, your religion is BS because you worship Mary. And I'm like, Sigh. 
So, and it's hard sometimes to explain how that works to like, uh, especially Protestants. I grew up Calvinist and it was, Mary was almost a curse word. It was very, I, I still have a little bit of like, a little bit of resentment about it because it was like, don't ask questions about her. We don't really talk. We'll mention her at Christmas really quickly. And then that's it, right? Like don't even bring it up other than that. And it's because it's this reactionary mentality where it's like, whatever the Roman Catholics do, we're completely opposed to that. And that's the basis of our theology. So if they over venerate her, we're going to like completely ignore her and and condemn any effort to give her any sort of veneration at all. And like David said, uh, the orthodox approach to that is very balanced. So I'm super glad that you kind of explained the nuance there because now when people yell at me about it, I can be like, just go watch this video at the timestamp and, and David will explain it so that you can understand. <laughs> um, so I don't know, do we have any other questions, guys? I'll check it one more time. If not, that's fine. Oh, Rigovich did. Oh, Rigovich, you're a woman. I'm sorry. She says, I have Googled this, but was Mary Magdalene a prostitute? I have found contradictory answers. That's actually a good question. What do we know about Mary Magdalene, David? I, I'll i be honest. I, I don't actually know a lot about that topic. What I do know is that um, it seems to be the case that she isn't a uh you know that word <laughs> um but i don't really specifically know a lot about a lot about that because again as you said this the, the popular claim is that she is but my instinct is i don't think she is but even if she was i mean at, the, at you know christ uh dined with people who were sinful but the key thing here is that they repented so i think that's the key important point here but that, that is yeah. this is part of subject i don't really know much about um I have that, looked into topic. it. I have looked into it a little bit because the Catholics and the Protestants love to talk about Mary Magdalene. And the problem in researching her historicity that I have found is that there's a lot of Gnostic gospels written about her that had a ton of influence. There's like medieval Catholic kind of fan fiction lore that was written about her. So it has over time become really difficult to nail down the actual historicity of her life and the details. And what I, I asked something about this in my catechism. It's been like a year and a half, but from what I can remember, I believe I was told that we don't know for sure she is a prostitute, but that we know that she probably lived a life of some kind of sinful, you know, she was probably living in some kind of sinful way prior to following Christ, but that we don't have like confirm confirmation that she was like a prostitute. Um, we do have saints like St. Mary of Egypt, who definitely was and repented of that and, and became a saint. So um, I would just, yeah, I would be a little cautious with the Mary Magdalene stuff, because like I said, there's a lot of Gnostic and Roman Catholic and other heretical sects that have created tons of fan fiction around her and made her into this character that we can't historically verify. So... Yeah, I, I, I find that very strange. I mean, every time you kind of talk against... Um, you know, sexual degeneracy and stuff like that. It was like, but Mary Magdalene. And it was like, again, yes. the point, like, even if she was, the point is she repented. I mean, the, the whole point of Christ dining with sinners is that he's calling them to repentance. He's calling them to a life of living like him and, and, to, and to living like God in, in that sense, right? I mean, so it doesn't even really matter if she was or she wasn't, uh, in a, you know, when discussing this with some people who are trying to like push this point that she was. But, and yeah, again, to my understanding, um, I don't really know either way. I I have heard that this kind of tradition starts with Saint Gregory, um, the Saint Gregory the Great, who was a pope in the West in the sixth century. Uh, but that's kind of like the first time this kind of ends up like this association is is made. But again, I don't I don't really know. But yeah, I think the point here that's really important again is that. If she was, well, she did. She stopped being one when she lived a Christ-like life, and that's the kind of point that we all need to consider: is that if we are sinners, we should be transformed into living like Christ. That's the kind of thing that I think a lot of people have to bear in mind. And I, I don't like the propagandizing of people's previous sinful lives right. as if that's what was Christian. When the whole point is, you're supposed to move away from that. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah, people like to do that with the woman at the well and and all kinds of yeah. other things. Yeah, I hear that all the time too. And I'm like, you're forgetting the whole go and sin no more part. Pretty important. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. And then one other question. I don't want to keep you all day, but one other question is, what is the Orthodox view of Joseph? Yeah, you mean Joseph, the the one who was betrothed to the Virgin Mary? Yes. Yeah. Well, we don't consider. Well, the the holy family icons are heterodox. We don't believe. We don't have those icons. We don't believe in that kind of an idea because Joseph did not have. Uh, relations with the Virgin Mary. And the reason why that, to, to explain this very simply, is that the Virgin Mary lived a life like Christ. She was cleansed of sin by giving birth to Christ. And so she lived a life in accordance with the highest spiritual manner that a human being can live. Now, what is the highest spiritual mode of living that a human being can have um, in relation to, uh, how shall I say, how you live how you know whether you have sexual relations or not saint paul gives the answer virginity is superior to marriage both are good but virginity is superior to 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 marriage and this is what we see and this is why we point out that joseph is betrothed uh he's not married in a traditional sense to the virgin mary and the reason why this betrothal happens is, is in fact to protect the virgin mary from danger this is what saint jerome says and that the virginity of the Virgin Mary is is maintained because again she lives the life of like the highest spiritual standards and this is also foreshadowed in her as you know living in the temple. It's also foreshadowed in the Old Testament, right? The Ark remains clean, uh, right? The Ark of the Covenant, uh, or how the the Virgin Mary is the burning bush because the the bush is not consumed by the presence of God, and so likewise the Virgin Mary is not consumed. Uh, nor destroyed by the presence of Christ in her womb. So that's kind of the simple answer that I will give. But, but aside from that, I mean, that's kind of... And we also need to consider, I mean, according to St. Epiphanius of Cyprus, <laughs> uh, you know, St. Joseph was 80, 90 years old when yes. they were betrothed. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Protestants really need to reconsider. I mean, if they're talking about them having relations, they really need to think about this more truly. I mean, you're basically saying that um, you're very you're very wrong if you don't believe a 15 year old 14 year old didn't have relations with the 80 90 year old. I mean, that's just right, that's kind of right. something else that people need to. Joseph was you know Saint Joseph was not a young man. No. Okay, people need to understand he was not even in his 30s. He was not in his 40s. He was a very 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 old man. And yeah, that, that's a. And if you're not going to believe Saint Epiphanius, I mean, most traditional historical accounts for Saint Joseph, you know, it's the same. You know, it's, they, they all agree that St. Joseph was very, very old. So um, either you're going to say that historical Christians didn't have had no clue about Christianity, or you're going to have to <laughs> admit St. Epiphanius' problem. And this is important because, for example, with images, um, Eusebius says that, you know, Gentiles, right, you know, Gentile converts who made images of Christ, they didn't just make images of Christ by just, like, freestyling it. They had sources on how Christ looked like. And so the icons that we have of Christ, you know, they, they come back to that, right? So we actually do have evidence of what Christ actually looked like. So a lot of early Christians had a lot of knowledge about uh, Christianity and, and certain details about Christianity that we don't really have in spite of all of these written records, right? But, but they had because of oral tradition and something I learned from one of the classes that I had in university is that in, when, when contrasted with the written law of Athens and the oral law of Sparta, the oral law of Sparta actually um, lasted longer and it was also preserved in greater detail because it was part of oral tradition, because it was maintained by the life of, you know, by the way of the living of the Spartans. Whereas Athenians, you know, they will sometimes reinterpret texts and Hey, that sounds crazy. That will never happen, right? With the American <laughs> Constitution, that will never happen. <laughs> no, so the text get the says point. what it means and means what it says, right? Um, so exactly. <laughs> we seem to have sparked a slight controversy here in the chat. And uh, Rachel Para DeLong asks, um, she had a question about why virginity is holier than being in a virtuous marriage, but she also said, what about the verse that says he, Joseph did not know her until after she had Jesus? It's in Matthew. And then she says, also mm -hmm. people in the Gospel of John knew his father and mother, so he wasn't that much older than her. Matthew implies Joseph knew Mary, and Mary and Jesus' brothers visited him, and Joseph was alive in the book of John. 
All right. So this is the classical Protestant argument. So first right. of all, a lot of people are called brothers when they're not blood brothers. This is standard Near Eastern culture. Um, as someone who lives in the Near East, I call a lot of my friends brothers. I call a lot of my cousins brothers and sisters. We, this is regular uh, language. And the, the brothers of Christ, right, they're not uh, brothers from Mary. They're brothers from St. Joseph. Uh, so that's one thing that you, people need to understand. Another thing that people need to also understand about uh, knowing, right? Like the, the term until, right? So she's pointing out about the term until. I think this is Matthew 128 or 26. Mm -hmm. um, so until in Greek does not mean that there was a change of that afterwards. And we can see this with the end of you know Matthew 28, where Christ says that he will be with the apostles until the end of the ages. So does that mean that Christ will cease being with you know his people after the end of the age if that's the case if that's what you mean i mean then you basically you're not christian like i'm sorry right. but you're not christian this proves you know th but in the greek language itself i mean until if i say um uh, that the virgin mary remained virgin until um you know she was betrothed that doesn't mean that she ceased being a virgin after she was betrothed it's just pointing out a time in which she remained virgin. It doesn't mean that there was a change afterwards, similar to how Christ remains with um, his people after the end of time as well. So people need to understand that as well. And I think, um, oh, and, and an extra point um, is that Christ does not, you know, if the Virgin Mary had uh, kids of her own, then it makes absolutely no sense for Christ to give the Virgin Mary to the Apostle John. Why would you yeah. do that if she will be completely alone with no relatives? You will give her to, you know, one of her own kids. But no, Christ says, no, uh, behold, this is now your mother to Apostle John. So <laughs> either Apostle John is secretly a son of Mary. <laughs> which, and obviously, no one's going to think that. Or it means that Virgin, Ma the Virgin Mary had no kids of her own. And, you know, the, the second option is obviously much more realistic. And again, you need to think about, you You can't think about this with the American mindset, okay? Right. Look at this. Look, Americans, this might be very difficult. <laughs> I don't want to be mean to you, but this should not be that difficult to understand. First century Near Eastern Mediterraneans had a very different culture and expressions than modern day Americans. You, you really have to understand this, okay? And if you want a, a simple answer to this, just look at early church tradition. You will you will very clearly see that the early Christians believed that the Virgin Mary remained virgin. Uh, and St. Jerome, in fact, defended the virginity of Mary, and he was a 4th century church father. So, I mean, I, I, th there's a lot more evidence for the virginity of Mary, whereas the, the arguments against, it's all circumstantial, circumstantial evidence, if they're even evidence, which I will say they're not. Again, uh, Christ having brothers, those are, again, those are brothers from... St. Joseph, they're not brothers from the Virgin Mary. Uh, right. So that's from a St. Joseph's earlier marriage. And this, people also have to bear in mind the different genealogies in Matthew and Luke. Um, one is from, they're both start moving from Joseph. So a lot of people think one is from the Virgin Mary, the other is from Joseph. No, both are from Joseph. One starts from the natural father of Joseph and the other starts from the adoptive father of Joseph, right? So this kind of gives you the idea, again, Joseph had a long life and... <laughs> Um, and that's something, and, and again, that he wasn't a young man, um, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, some of the only bad reviews on my book that I will say are legitimate because there's a few troll reviews from obvious feminists who are like, this woman is hateful and just wants to take away women's rights. And they obviously didn't read it and just left. I'm, the troll I'm sorry reviews. interrupting, but I didn't answer sure. this one other question. Sure. Yeah. Asked. Why is... Uh, virginity holier than marriage again notice yes. marriage and virginity are both good but one is better than the other again don't think about this dialectically both are good so people are asking okay why is why is virginity better well let me ask this counter question why was christ virgin why didn't christ start a family a very simple question why wasn't christ married well why did he live a virgin life well he lived a virgin life because again as the highest example of um, the spiritual life being, you know, the God man himself, he lived the virgin life. And St. Paul explicitly says the virgin life is superior to the married life. I know there's a lot of married people that like marriage and they believe in Christian mission. And I do too, but 
we have to be mature and understand that you know the virgin life if you can live that life is is superior that doesn't mean that they're going to you know someone who doesn't fulfill the obligations of the virgin life they 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 might still be condemned and someone who lives the obligation of the marriage married life will be saved and again the first will be least and the least will be first so you know people should not be super hung over over um over that but again scripture very clearly says the virgin life is superior and that's just that's just it yeah and people will hear that and they will think that we have this um augustinian view of sex within marriage that sex is just this bad sinful dirty gross thing we don't really have that view of sex within marriage either so again it's this either or black and white dialectical thinking that i think a lot of us especially in america have a lot of trouble with right of of there being hierarchy that's problematic because america specifically is an enlightenment uh, project. It's an egalitarian enlightenment project. And I was just going to say the reason that I have a few bad reviews about my book from people who really didn't like it. It was not because of what I said about women. It's because I took a whole chapter to explain the foundings of America as a Christian nation, that it was some of the most radical Protestant sects that came over from England, who even the Church of England was, um, you know, persecuting because they were so crazy. They were so radical. And I take a whole chapter to go over what a lot of them thought, the weird things they believed in, the experimental communes they built. Like this is a really unexplored part of American history that that we were populated initially by these really radical Protestants, like the Puritans, the Shakers, the Quakers, some of the things they believed in, like universalism, um, like they wouldn't even put a cross in their church. They wouldn't call their church a church. They called it a meeting house. Like these were deeply radical, deeply heretical sects that were trying to escape persecution from the mainline Protestants. So they're the ones who came here and kind of built the foundations. And we inherited a lot of those heresies, a lot of those mistakes, and a lot of that weird thinking without knowing it. So a lot of us are really operating off of these things without understanding that that's where it came from. So, and it made a lot of Protestants and Catholics mad because I kind of said, well, you know, the Catholics have some blame here too, because a lot of their innovations and corruptions are what brought this on. Um, so I'm sorry if you guys don't like that. I don't mean to offend you. I don't have any hatred or ill will towards you. It's just that I don't want to perpetuate heresy. And I think that those heresies are the roots of a lot of the problems that we're dealing with right now. And the reason why David and I have to come on here and explain why women shouldn't be clergy in the church. So Hope that that kind of answers some questions. Um, Rachel, if you have a lot of questions for David, I would definitely recommend go over to his channel. He's got a great catalog of videos. He's super good at explaining so many of these concepts. Highly, highly recommend. And then, you know, maybe send him a super chat if you have a specific question you want him to answer in his next stream, because I don't want to keep him here all day. I've already had him almost two hours. And it's been such a great conversation. And you brought up a lot of points that I was really hoping you would cover. It just went as perfectly as it could go from my from my position as to what I wanted to talk about. So um, thank you so much for coming on and tell everybody where they can find you and what you have coming up, if anything. Uh, so uh, what do I have coming up? I have a couple of streams planned. I have a debate on the Filioca that's going to happen on October 7th uh, on Sam Shamoon's channel. And... I just, you know, I'll just plan to continue making videos and just roll as as usual. I mean, I have a pretty, I will say, consistent schedule. One, at least one video per week, and I just kind of continue doing that. And most of my videos, again, happens to be on uh, Orthodox theology, but specifically kind of historical theology, and it gets in depth. It's not something that I expected to occur, but and I don't want to toot my own horn. It's not because I'm amazing or anything like that. If anything, I mean, if you had expert priests that will do what I do much better than I do. I mean, I talked about authority so much. I mean, I will, I will say, okay, here's my authority. Here's what I have. I give it to you. You know, enjoy. <laughs> but you know, I had a lot of people kind of asking me, you know, how about you make a video on this? How about how about you make a video on that? And like people having doubts over certain issues about this part of orthodoxy, this other part of orthodoxy, this part of church history just forced me to kind of 
<laughs> learn about a lot of like the advanced details and 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 things like that so a lot of it happens to be that but it's still fun and i think it's still important um and a lot of people kind of have this negative attitude about this yeah, kind of stuff yes. like they think that oh i don't have to this is the stuff that high iq theologians deal with i can't deal with it and it's like okay well you might not be able to understand in the, in the fullest capacity but it's still good to actually uh, know the re relevant piece of information because what script scripture tells us that we are to you know we should give an account of our faith and defend it when we are put in that situation right so we should be able to give a defense of our faith and yes. you know we live in the, in the 21st century you know unfortunately in a sense we have to learn a lot more about our faith compared to what people previously knew and we don't happen to have a lot of the traditional methods of learning those things so um yes i try to help in i try to help in that regard and you know you also in the start said you know i kind of have you know uh i could like as in i have some authority or something like i would like to correct that i'm not a priest or i'm not like a spiritual father i'm not a spiritual figure i'm just a layman i just asked i just talked about this with my with my priest uh, a couple of years ago i talked i mentioned this channel i talked to him about like what i do and i said you know if if you want me to do the, you know if you allow me to do this i'll do it if you don't then i'll delete the channel and i'll do something else and he said okay you can do it it's whatever right <laughs> so right that's the kind of <laughs> i have an allowance so to speak uh, but yes. i it's not like i'm a official ecumenical patriarch it's spokesperson <laughs> right right like uh maybe one day i don't know <laughs> well to give a quick apologetic for my apologist friends i you know we hear this ortho bro stuff thrown mm -hmm. around a lot and online orthodoxy is is brutal and you shouldn't you shouldn't listen to these people that kind of stuff coming out um you know regularly but it's we live in an age that's an information age it's a digital age it's a global age and especially in america this is very important for us here because like i said we have this problematic background and the church in america the protestant churches are in an absolute shambles like i said there's nobody going to them anymore they've become so fractured and so crazy that people are really lost and looking for like what is the true church what's what is a traditional church even like if if there's 500 different Protestant churches with 500 different interpretations of what the Bible says. What do I do? This is how I came to it, right? I said a prayer to God saying, I don't know what church I should be in. I want to worship you properly. That seems really important to me. And I don't know how to do that. So guide me. And, and literally within two weeks, I discovered that orthodoxy exists when it had been, it's been very hidden from the West due to a couple things. Number one, the Great Schism. And then number two, the Cold War. The Cold War had this huge iron curtain between East and West. And even now, like my friend, my God bless you, Joyful Matthew for being in the chat. He still has like this um, hostility towards Easternness, you know, Russian bad, uh, Eastern bad, you know, uh, we're Western, we're Latins, you know, uh, <laughs> we're white guys, like all these crazy presuppositions that people have. And it's like, we need yeah. apologists out there to cut through all of the craziness and to make arguments, to have debates so that we can sort out what's going on because things have gotten greatly confused. Yeah. I mean, and, and with that, like the whole thing about like, you know, we're Westerners, we're Latin or Protestant. It's like, okay. I, I have a Turkish name. I'm part of Turkish culture. I lived in Turkey for many, many years. My parents are Turkish. So should I be Muslim? I mean, that's right. it. if I shouldn't be, if I should be Christian, then should I like, should I be Western Christian or right. should I be Eastern Christian? Well, I'm not Western. I mean, I think this whole idea about like, oh, my heritage is Western. Therefore, I should be a Western Christian. I think it's just a, I don't want to be disrespectful. Yeah. I'm not, I don't want to be disrespectful. Yeah. This is a very stupid argument. Like it's, it it's an embarrassingly bad argument. Like you, I think. If you unironically believe this, I think you honestly need to be a little embarrassed with yourself because you're kind of saying religion is just this cultural phenomenon. It's right. not a universe. It's not this universal truth. It's just a cultural phenomenon that depends on where I was born. And if that's what religion is, then religion is obviously BS. <laughs> that, 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 that will obviously be BS because then it will right. mean that God is not universal. Right. Like God doesn't exactly. speak to all of humankind, but he does speak to all of humankind. He has established a body of authority and one single body of authority because he has one body, right? And 
you know, whether you believe it to be the Orthodox Church, which it obviously is the Orthodox Church, or the Roman Catholic Church, or the Anglican Church, if you really want to go there, you kind of have to say that, okay, there's only one authority here, because this doesn't really mesh with Christianity that well. And a lot of people think this way. It's really, really insane. But yeah. I well, I always say, I always say, if this is the logic, then I should be pagan because my ancestors were Irish and Dutch. They were pagan before they converted to Christianity. So I guess I should be pagan then by that logic. If if all we're after is tradition and honoring our ancestors, then, you know, if you're a, a Nordic descent, then you have to worship Thor and Odin, I guess. So it's just it's a silly fallacy and um, it's not really about like East and West being pitted against each other, but Christianity has a documented history. It started in a time and a place that are very real and people want to, I've had people on Twitter tell me that uh, Christianity started in Europe, that it started, you know, in Europe and it's a European religion for Europeans. And I'm like, Oh boy, uh, I should send you some books. Like, so it's, there's so much ignorance and so much misunderstanding that I love to see the debate. I like to see the apologetics and I, I love people focusing on the early church and church history and the theology for people that do have questions like I did and like so many other people do. Um, so thank you so much for coming on today. It was an honor to have you on my channel. And I hope that this, I'm sure we'll, maybe we'll do a follow-up at some point because it seems like we've got more questions than we provided answers today. So we'll see. And maybe if, if David's down to come back and, and do another show at some point, he can, he can answer more questions. But for today, go to his channel on YouTube and follow him. Follow him on Twitter at MedWhiteAcolyte. Is that the right one? Yes, yes, that's the right one. I, I was actually planning on changing it, but... okay. I don't think you can change it when you have Twitter blue, so I'm stuck with that. Darn. <laughs> but, For now, yeah. anyways, he's mm -hmm. at Med White Acolyte. So, yeah. David Erhan, thank you so much for coming on. And everybody mm -hmm. in the chat, thank you for coming and watching. Mm -hmm. And we will see all you guys next time. Yep. Goodbye.